this is the site um, under consideration. So um, you all know this very well. It's been there for a long time uh, at the intersection of Parham and I-95. Um, it's a, um, the best product site is about 93 acres. And then just to the north of it is another 200 acres uh, owned by um, uh, a, pr a private entity that we are also going to include in the uh, uh, urban mixed use master plan, but it's not part of the county's holdings at this moment. Uh, overall, the development site that we'll be master planning under the zoning that Joe described is about 200 acres uh, represented here by this slide. Uh, the best product site is, um, is in red. Uh, Scott Farm, uh, just to the north, is, a, is about 110 acres. Uh, there is another property uh, that's not part of the master plan, just to be clear, uh, St. Gertrude's Athletic Fields. Um, and uh, so the, the purple and the red pieces are the ones that will be ultimately be making up our plan. And I just want to uh, jump to the end of the, of the movie uh, for a moment so that we can sort of work our way back to how we got to this. So uh, this represents about a 15-year build-out um, of, of Green City. It starts incrementally. All of this doesn't happen at once. A lot of infrastructure goes in to support this. We'll talk about, the, uh, about that. Uh, the repurposing of best products uh, is, is part of our early work. And you can see there in the, in the center of it uh, an urban arena. These kinds of developments are uh, extraordinarily important because they uh, create synergies. They create synergies of use. They create uh, walkable uh, districts. They, um, they are not um, uh, sort of uh, homogenized zoning so that one entire section of the county is all housing and another entire section is all retail. This zoning was invented specifically for the purpose to get this kind of a project to happen. Um, getting uh, focus only on the properties that will be part of the zoning, you can see here uh, the, the two parcels that will be combined together to form the zoning. We're going to also, I'm going to take you through each of these uses so you don't have to, you know, to memorize this image. We'll, we'll come back to it here in a moment. And, and talk about some of the important features of it. Before we do that, I think the, the, probably the biggest question the communities have about projects like this is traffic. Uh, and uh, we, this would not be possible as a project if we were also not simultaneously working to um, uh, advance the Magellan Parkway e extension. Um, I, I'll, I'll leave those kinds of questions for you know, my colleagues here at the county to answer, but I think it's important to know that this, that process is underway and will create an important linkage uh, to, to disperse traffic very easily and efficiently toward, you know, toward the freeways and to other major roads and away from, from neighborhoods. You heard the term from the, um, the county uh, executive of, of, uh, of an eco-district. What it, an eco district is kind of a rare uh, planning type. It, it really describes a district that it tries to achieve uh, high levels of, of uh, sustainable energy performance, uh, wastewater, carbon neutrality, um, uh, also uh, health. Uh, we, are, we are looking for well building certification in, in our project throughout. We want to create a walkable 20-minute lifestyle in Green City. So the idea of cars flowing in and out um, will be lessened because we want people to live there, live there, work there, and do things there. Um, and then also environmental justice, you know, the, the process of doing this uh, out in the open, in the sunlight, and making sure that there's opportunity for everybody to enjoy the features and benefits of the project. Um, there's a lot in the press uh, over the last few years, and it's increasing uh, year by year on climate change. Green City looks uh, very directly at this issue, uh, looks it right in the eye and says, we, th we can do better. Uh, eco districts are designed to, um, to be balanced developments in terms of energy, waste, um, water usage. Um, I put this slide up because these are all the covers of the Washington Post magazine. One publication, uh, so 
periodically every every Sunday they, they publish the Washington Post magazine, but uh, more and more we're seeing these kinds of covers. The one on the left just came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, nurtured by nature as a direct result of people's response to the pandemic. Uh, green City is very much uh, a nature-based development as well. So the green, the green applies really to sustainability, but it also applies to the natural resources and the development. I want to just touch on a few of those sustainability issues. Um, the connection to nature is first and foremost. So one of the great um, discoveries when we got to a chance to uh, walk the site was uh, its you know, wonderfully intact natural resources. They need some restoration, but they're there. And so we want to work with them. There are wetlands that are on the site. There are uh, stream beds, all part of the Chesapeake uh, watershed, Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, those are all things that we hope to and plan to, not hope to, but will integrate into the master plan of the project. Uh, you see the term biophilic design. What that means is that people want to be surrounded by natural things. That's why we bring house plants into our houses. That's why we plant uh, gardens in the backyard. Uh, it's, it's, it's humans' natural instincts to want to be in nature. Uh, biophilic design stresses that. It, it, it makes sure that buildings are integrated well into natural systems. So first and foremost, our connection to the natural site and where we can make improvements to that and fine tune that, uh, we want to do that. And by the way, any, anything you see here regarding the, the, the integrated park system, um, that's open to everybody. This is not a private development in that sense that, that we have about 40% uh, of this site will be left uh, mostly in its natural state uh, with some additions, some improvements, some cleanup that you'll see. But our, our hope is that this becomes a, a tremendous natural resource for the community. 20 minute living means then that we will build residential retail office and other uses you know, within a zone where people can walk to it. So your lifestyle can be working from home if you want to, but then you can just walk to, you know, to make purchases, or if you do have an office in the area, you can walk there too. Um, it also means uh, connectivity to mobility. So that's something we will, we will work on with the county is uh, to make sure that we have access to transit systems. 20-minute uh, living is uh, all of these kinds of things. Uh, we talked about mobility and, and getting public transit uh, fully integrated into the, the project. Uh, that's going to, that's one of the longer lead uh, conversations that we're going to have, but it starts with a, you know, with a good plan and a good reason for doing it. And we're very, we're very forward leaning when it comes to types of systems. So uh, we're very interested to explore you know, electric car uh, support, um, even uh, electric transit uh, modalities that might happen within the district. Uh, these are just some of the uh, inspirational images that we, we wanted to put up to show the diversity of, of transportation modes. Uh, this area gets uh, uh, sufficient water, rainwater, to, uh, to treat seriously in terms of rainwater harvesting. Also, what we do with it after it hits the, hits the surfaces of rooftops and, and the ground plane. And so we're going to work very carefully with the county to, um, to bring on uh, good, smart stormwater management and uh, rainwater collection features, um, aquifer recharging, and all those kinds of things that are very important. Um, energy, uh, we, we happen to be at a good point in uh, the conversion to uh, green renewable energy sources, both the Commonwealth and Dominion Energy have uh, gone on record in the last year of having uh, a net zero green energy uh, goals within our lifespan. Well, some of our lifespans, I hope mine, but uh, that's, that's the goal. Uh, green City advances that goal as well. And so we, uh, uh, we're very excited by the science that this project will help bring to this and the focus to Henrico that we will bring nationally uh, to uh, make this project as, as green as we possibly can. Uh, one of the buildings we will we'll talk about uh, for a few extra minutes, and that's the Best Products Building, uh, which we uh, plan to make a living building. Um, we'll explain what that is. There's about 200 
uh, buildings in the world right now that um, uh, have complied with the living building challenge. That means zero uh, uh, fossil fuels used to, to energize the building. It means uh, the water that falls on the building supplies the water for the building. Um, there's, there's several other categories that are very, very um, uh, extreme in the sense of, of the uh, sustainability spectrum. We're very excited because we think this is a great candidate for that. Uh, this then, I want to spend a few minutes on uh, the 40 percent of the site that's, uh, that we plan to um, uh, maintain as park system. Uh, when we first walked the site, we discovered um, you know, the, the, the natural stream beds that were there. There wasn't running water in it necessarily. It, it certainly happens when there's rain, uh, uh, rain happening. But wetlands uh, generally have water in them all the time, and there's an eco, a biodiversity and an ecosystem in these wetlands that need to be maintained, and they're part of the system that we want to protect. But we also want to enjoy them. So these are these are some of the photographs that uh, that we took and some of our earliest visits to the site. Um, uh, you know, these are these are. You know, just as you see them, we didn't do anything special to get these shots, uh, but so are these images. So we we also came across uh, part, portions of the site that have been used as as a dump. Vehicles are abandoned. Um, it's not it's not throughout, but it's uh, it's obvious that uh, we we will want to come in and do a really serious cleanup early on in the process. You know, and open up some of these uh, uh, opportunities early. Um, the Green City Park system that you saw in that uh, earlier rendering is a collection of ideas. These include, uh, I'm going to just go through the uh, sequence of them, but you see on the right the map of the district and these, uh, these sort of green, it's like a green pearl necklace, if you will, uh, sub-parklets sub that are connected by other uh, walking areas. And while you can't probably see it on your screen, if you follow the thread of walking all the way from Parham to the, uh, to the 295, that's a, that's a mile and a half uh, of walking. So a, a nice three mile round trip completely within a park system. Uh, we, would, we would work to restore and um, maintain the, the natural wetlands that are there. Every once in a while, you know, there will be a, a street crossing in the park system, and on those, we certainly will be paying attention to uh, creating uh, integrated green streets so that the, there's as much of a seamless crossing as possible. There will be a few, we believe, a few man-made water features. And uh, you can see how those uh, those will be enhancing some of our more urban plaza areas. Where we come to wetlands, um, rather than just avoid them altogether, it would be nice to, to experience them. So in those occasions, there's plenty of precedence for creating uh, uh, light light touching boardwalks that, that cross over the wetlands. Certainly won't build close to them, uh, but these are ways that you get to kind of get into them and experience them a little bit. When we started uh, the master plan back in February, the, the, the pandemic wasn't, wasn't really well understood. We, nobody really knew what the protocols were and how, how to deal with it. But one of the things we started to miss pretty quickly was access to nature and especially with kids, access to, to play. And so uh, I'm old enough to remember when you know, my parents let me loose, I would be able to go out and go make up my own adventure, go see what kind of critters I could find and what kind of forts I could build and those kinds of things. And we're missing that. And so the idea that we would create some opportunity for creative nature play within the district, you know, is very exciting to us too. Uh, meadows. Um, so we, we are just getting into the science of the park district. We have uh, conversations going now with some leading thinkers and in the, uh, biodiversity uh, and, uh, and park planning and very eager to open that up. That, that would be one of, uh, Supervisor, that'd be one of the great community conversations to be having because this is something open to everybody. I want to just run through the uses so that you understand that, that uh, rendering that you saw early on is made up of uh, half a dozen completely discrete uses. Uh, the first one is, is residential. And so there's a broad spectrum of housing types that we want to bring to the site, uh, all the way from uh, 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 multifamily units in our village core, 
uh, to townhomes uh, and so forth. Uh, all told about 2,400 residential units over the course of the development cycle, which we'll, which we'll show you here at the end of the presentation. The multifamily uh, pieces of it, about half of the residential units you see here would happen in our village center. And those would all sit atop retail. So there's about 280,000 square feet of, of retail. And these retail operations, all, all of the tenants within Green City will be operating on a, on a green operation protocol as well. There'll be uh, significant um, waste management. There'll be no organic waste that leaves Green City. It will all be processed, separated, mulched uh, on site. And um, uh, we think there's a lot of retailers who may, uh, who want, will want to be in that environment, who want to be in that kind of a community and we think they'll have a lot of customers who will also want to be in part of that environment. And that's, that's the unique um, economic development attractor to this development is it, it, it focuses on those retailers and tenants who might otherwise have passed over in Ranco or might otherwise pass over the area uh, if not for a very highly focused development like this. There's a couple of hotels in the plan. Um, uh, they don't happen immediately. I think the first one will happen uh, somewhat in conjunction with the arena development um, in about uh, 2025 at the latest, prob probably uh, could, could happen as early as 24. Uh, the, the next one is probably four or five years after that. But before we're finished with the development, uh, there will be two hotels and then uh, off the office uses. Now these, these represent conceptually the amount of office square footage. They don't, won't take necessarily these shapes or these heights, uh, or, uh, but how they get organized across the site is, it will be part of the planning process. I wanna focus um, on the best products headquarters uh, because that was the most daunting building challenge for us. And when we started looking at it, you know, we was, it was pretty charming to find some of the quirky elements of the project, things that might be hard for the county to uh, appreciate as, uh, as um, uh, office headquarters, we found kind of interesting. Um, obviously, the Eagles are, are fascinating. For those of you who don't, don't know that history, the Eagles sat upon the airline's terminal building in downtown New York in, in Manhattan. Um, uh, they were built in the 30s, and the, that's the artist on the right. Um, they were rescued uh, by the best products owners uh, and brought to Richmond, brought to Henrico County uh, as, part of their, uh, as part of their development. And there they still sit. Uh, you can just see them on top of the building. So uh, it would, it's a, uh, really fascinating to uh, incorporate them in the project. This is one of the early concepts for creating a living building out of the best products. A building. One of the things uh, that living buildings have to do is generate all of their power themselves. So 100% of the power comes from on-site sources. Um, what, the reason this makes a good candidate for this challenge is that it's a low, broad building. Uh, we don't have to rely on elevators for the most part, and we certainly would have them, but for the most part, we'd want to create an irresistible uh, stair system that would get people up and down. Uh, we would want to use the rooftops for rooftop uh, agriculture uh, or, or other other uses, but basically all aspects of the building become important. Uh, here we've opened up the middle of the of the site so that we've got uh, you know common lobby. Um, at this moment, this the, the the nation doesn't know much about Green City, but we we believe this will be a very attractive uh, headquarters uh, site for uh, somebody who has signed a climate pledge. There are. Um, uh, those of you following the Facebook development project or some of the other big developments, Amazon, Google, all have signed uh, uh, climate pledges at a very high level. They want to work with companies who have also signed climate pledges. Uh, those companies, uh, you know, will covet space like this in the future. Here's that, uh, here's that common lobby. And then, uh, and then the arena project, um, we were able to do over the last years, uh, this isn't an impulsive idea at all. This is something that's being, been studied for several years now. Uh, we believe that the market, this is a very, very critically underserved market in this industry. Um, the arena would be about 17,000 seats um, and host about 180 event days. 
This area, Richmond and Henrico County, along the I-95 corridor is uh, absolute uh, oceanfront property for the touring economy, the arena touring economy. And you can see arenas here uh, all the way from Boston to, to Miami. I, I was the architect for about half of these arenas, so uh, I understand this routing process and the economies of this. Um, and now that the Coliseum is, is closed, um, there's a tremendous opportunity to capture some, some wonderful touring shows. The arena uh, it was pretty far down the road in, in being designed. You can see here that it had a very flexible floor plan. This happens to be the setup in the concert mode. Um, you can see at the bottom where it says uh, 12,467 JPJ. That's the John Paul Jones Arena. We would be a couple thousand seats larger, which means we will capture all the shows. Uh, it also means that for tournament play, uh, we would be able to create a, an opportunity for NCAA uh, first and second round uh, uh, tournaments. Um, uh, the, the local universities uh, all covet the idea of being able to host those kinds of programs here and we'd be able to do that. And then just quickly, these are the kind of shows that we would imagine uh, happening, uh, 683,000 visitors a year and, uh, and about 180 events. And in the final sequence, and um, we can take questions after that, is just to show you how fast this comes online. So um, as, as Joe and, uh, and others were saying, this isn't something that we start digging on, digging ground uh, on Thursday. So uh, it's going to take some time. We expect this coming year to be the year that we uh, work through uh, organizing the park system, uh, trying to create the boundaries for it, understanding what goes in it. Uh, the first physical building uh, is the best products renovation that you just saw, uh, shown here at the bottom. And the opening for that, we hope, is in 23. Um, we will then start, uh, uh, we will then be working on a couple of other uh, sequences. One would be uh, some residential units, uh, as well as our village core would start uh, coming to, to light in 24. Uh, the arena would come online in 25. But this is, you can see then kind of how this e evolves over the course of, of years.